Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your current uh, location. Thank you very much for coming to this session today. And also thank you for keeping up with your work in this uh, difficult time of pandemic. And welcome to the session 2.3 and 2.2. The session 2.2 is about uh, challenges of on-site inspection. And the session 2.3 is about uh, seismoacoustic sources in theory and practice. So we'll have a, a joint session. Uh, I will I will go through the list to just present who is going first, and then uh, the next one. Uh, in the in the session 2.2, which will be the first, we'll start with the uh, Rajendra Prashad. Badari, and then the next will be uh, Ang Lee, followed by Julius Cosma, who is uh, here with me, and uh, Antonietta Riso goes next, then uh, Suresh Shiresta, and uh, at this session 2.2, uh, the last will be uh, Laurel Sinclair. And then after that, we'll move to the session 2.3. We'll start with uh, Yasamin uh, Amid Shanki. And then next will be Stuart Nifres, Ronnie Quintero, Michelle Grobler, Jessica Kibble, uh, Jairo Viralobos, Artimi Novo, Novo, Novoselov, Anthony Turquet. Aldela Tamayanti Kurnami Rati, uh, Patrick Hope, on, on behalf of, uh, of Gibler, and then uh, Ivan Kitov, Shahar Shani Kagmiel, and uh, we had uh, uh, last time, last minute uh, registration from uh, as Pastor. If we have some time still at the hand, we will take your presentation as well. Um, thank you very much. My name is uh, Paulino Feitiu, and with me is Mr. Julius Cosma. Together, we will convene this meeting, uh, this session today. And uh, before uh, we start the presentation, I would ju just like to remind some few uh, uh, rules which will guide uh, the session. Each presenting participant will have two minutes to present his, uh, his poster. And the objective of this presentation is just to, to promote your posters and attract audience for the same poster. And at the end, we'll have uh, some time, if possible, to, for some discussion in question and answers. And, but also, uh, we have our the virtual S&T 2021 portal open, as well as uh, video rooms. So again, thank you very much. With no delay, uh, we'll start with the first presenter, who is uh, Rajendra Prasad Bandari. You have two minutes. Uh, Rajendra, are you connected? Oh, Peng Lee, please, Peng Lee, you have the floor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. loud and clear. Okay, so I have uh, actually uh, four presentations. Uh, do you want me to present all these four or just one of them? Uh, let's try to present all of them, four of them. So just be uh, a bit uh, also with time. Okay, thank you. So I will start with uh, this one. Can I share the screen? Yes, please share your screen, please. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? 
Can you see the screen? My shared screen? It's coming, yeah. Okay, so this one is actually, uh, I will be very brief, uh, just to fill in the gaps of the uh, ISOP for uh, the concept of the chain of custody. And we all know that uh, there is just a, a placeholder for uh, the concept of chain of custody for uh, OI size samples, especially uh, those sampling sampling samples. Uh, we still remember that uh, in the past exercises or training courses, we just use plastic bags, put the leaves and uh, the vegetations and the other uh, samples inside. Th there was just a concept and then we will just want to realize this concept through a concrete uh, technical solution. So this will be the first one. For the second one is actually we want to utilize the widely uh, commercially used penetrating radar to, to have, uh, uh, to realize a technical solution uh, for for the the geophysics uh, detection of the of the potential anomalies underground, and uh, I want to uh, draw the audience's attention is actually uh, this penetration radar has already been widely used in everyday life. For example, for the detection of the hidden tunnels uh, uh, underground on the on the on the highway, and uh, for the detection of uh, the flaws for the tunnels and uh, also for the detection of the uh, uh, of the underground uh, pipelines so we gathered very rich experience in this regard so we can make a customized design for the radar array and uh, i think this will uh, fit the requirements of the on-site inspection practical requirements uh, this the third one would be uh, would be a cognitive uh, uh, satellite communication uh, technical solution. Uh, this one uh, is actually uh, the first hot sports, hot sports of this uh, uh, equipment is, is lightweight, is seven kilo, and uh, it can be very flexible for, for making choices of different uh, set communication, commercial communication satellites available. We call it cognitive, uh, technology, and uh, this one is uh, is in in technical uh, scheme. It's a phased array antenna technology, so you don't need to change the orientation of the antenna. Uh, it can ad adapt itself to the to the to the communication source, and also it's it's highly reliable. Uh, I won't go to the detail of the specifications. If the audiences they have interest, we can have further discussion in this regard. The last one is actually uh, we provide uh, technical solution uh, to the for the simulation platform uh, for OSI. As we all know, that we need uh, mission planning. Uh, even for the selection of the base of operations and also the uh, uh, to make everyday planning for the different field teams to going out and uh, going back and for conducting the missions in, in the inspection area. So utilizing the simulation platform will be very useful for uh, have planning and mission uh, management uh, for the daily activity. And for this one, we actually provide, uh, uh, I think it's a it's very handy solution to this, uh, to this uh, mission. Thank you. So I finished my four presentations. Hello?
Hello, I finished. Yes. Thank you. Not that in that one, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello and welcome to brief introduction of this e-poster called Operation Support Center during preparations for section. Uh, as you can see, I'm representing a team of colleagues who are involved in the latest developments of the Operation Support Center. Can you see the next slide, please? The poster explains the updated concept of the Operation Support Center and illustrates how it was implemented within the new CTBTO Operation Center which integrates the monitoring and operation support for the IMS, IDC, and OSI regimes. Of course, the OSI component is not permanent. It's used when it is required. But the integration provides really significant improvement on efficiency and effectiveness of the operation support. The new developments were tested during the build-up exercise L conducted in November 2019 at the PTS premises and the largest part of the poster describes the scenario, conduct an evaluation of the exercise. We prepared a really interesting scenario, which included several aspects not tested during previous exercises, like the inspected state party liaison officer at the operation support center or requesting state party observers in the field. The BUEL was supposed to be the first of the series of uh, three exercises to validate the products of the OSI action plan 2016-19. Unfortunately, due to coronavirus, uh, we could not conduct the other two exercises. But the BUE Health itself proved to be a success and uh, gave us several inputs for further improvement of the op operation support center facility and procedures. So I invite you to review the poster and I'm looking forward to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Uh, the next presenter is Antonieta Riso. Antonieta, you have two minutes. Okay, uh, uh, we tried to get in contact with Antonita previously also we failed. We move to the next, Suresh Shureshta. Suresh. Okay, uh, uh, let's see, let's see uh, if she can uh, come later. Laurel Sinclair, you have, you have the floor. Thank you. My name is Laurel Sinclair. I'm with the Canadian National Data Centre. Uh, my poster is about a method to um, extrapolate and improve the precision of aerial radiation survey maps by inverting the measurement for the response of the system that made it. Uh, I've got some great data to show from two different measurement systems. One of those systems is a simple um, pointing uh, detector that's based on self-shielding. Um, the other one is a full Compton gamma imager. I can make a very quick presentation of one of the pieces of data. So here we have the simple direction detector mounted on a, a UAV platform, flies away from home base as far as it can and half a tank of gas comes back. And you can see that from the count rate alone, um, you can resolve one of the sources that was in the field of view, um, but the other one you can't uh, really pick up from count rate alone. Uh, individual directions second by second are giving you a bit of information, but it's vague. Um, this inversion method that uses the full system response obtained from Monte Carlo simulation and data validation um, is then applied to extract 
as much information as is available in the data about the position of those sources. So you see that we can actually reconstruct two positions very well. And what's really important operationally is that we're able to rule out um, huge um, sections of this um, hypothetical restricted uh, access zone uh, from needing further investigation. So I've got also very exciting data from the Compton Gamma Imager taking over a great distance, looking at an extended source and reconstructing where that is. Um, and I look forward to discussing this um, further with any interested people. Now to the session 2.3, the assessment of acoustic sources in theory and practice. So uh, the first the first presenter here is uh, Yasamin Yasamin Shamki. Yes. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my, I will uh, present about the Bulletin of Iraqi NDC event uh, analysis. In this uh, poster, uh, we, uh, uh, we used uh, three types of events, uh, acoustic, seismic, acoustic, and seismic. Uh, the first event in Pure, uh, near uh, Turkey, uh, we uh, used the uh, infrasound uh, stations of IMS, and the results analysis, uh, we use the DKK GPMCC uh, software and the uh, view tool with that as a new location of event over Turkey. Uh, the second uh, uh, event, explosion in military arsenal near HNX in Russia. Uh, we used uh, also IMA, IMS stations of uh, infrasound and seismic with view tool software, uh, seismic software analysis for its location. And the third uh, event, as look at the Iraq-Iran uh, border, uh, we, uh, in this uh, uh, analysis, uh, we used the, the tools of Seismic 3 and uh, due to data from seismic stations and uh, from IRS network, IMS, and local stations in Iraq, in addition to the, in addition also to the inclusion of real-time stations through Seismic 3. The different event analysis were of great advance in the use of the tools for the NDCs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. We will move now to the next presenter, Stuart in the press. Good morning. You have the floor. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear yes, you perfectly. Good morning. My name is Stuart Lewis, and I work for the UK NDC. Um, my poster is looking at a series of 30 explosions that occurred on the 7th of July 2011, just outside the Turkmenistan capital. These explosions were clearly observed at the primary seismic array guide, 12 kilometres to the south, and I'll show you some waveforms on the left-hand side of this figure. Um, they were also observed 23 kilometers away to the southeast of a three component station ash. And again, I show waveforms on the right of this slide. If we look at the guide waveforms, you can clearly see a P phase, an RG phase, and at about 60 seconds, you can see an interesting air to ground couple phase. On the right hand side of ash, again, you see these seismic phases clearly, but you see two air to ground couple arrays, air to ground couple waves around about 70 seconds. We use these P wave and RG arrivals to estimate yields due to the explosion. These explosions were also imaged on IMS infrasound arrays in Germany, Tunisia, Kazakhstan, and Russia, and we use these waveforms to also estimate yields for the explosion. The final part of my poster, we go back to looking at these air to ground couple waves and measure their amplitude in their period. We relate them to yields estimated using the P wave and RG phases. And we try to model them to understand what generated these waves. So, if you're interested in learning a bit more, please come by my poster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, we go to the next presenter, who is Ronnie Quintero. Please, you have the floor.
Ronnie, we cannot hear you. Ronnie, can you please unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yeah, now it's, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Greeting from Costa Rica. My name is Ronnie Quintero. I work at uh, of Costa Rica. We are really new on this uh, infrasound technology, but um, we have a, a big input from the uh, capacity building of the CTBTO. We have organized it, uh, some Latin America uh, Congress here in Costa Rica uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, we we also have in, um, installed some temporary station. We, we were lucky at that time we installed this uh, temporary station with the CTBTO organization to capture one of the volai of this meteorite that uh, you can see in the nature news uh, this uh, last year. And uh, that was uh, really important. And also uh, one of the important is that we have installed some single station in Costa Rica with the main goal to uh, monitor a uh, volcanic explosion. Uh, like uh, this explosion that I am showing here, that was uh, before yesterday. You see, with uh, uh, this is the goal that we we are uh, implementing now, that uh, to capture and monitor in the volcanic explosion. This is uh, the main goal that for for which we are using the infrastructure station. This is, you can see in my poster two point three two three three. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roni. We'll move to the next presenter. Michelle Robla, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Is that clear? Yes, yes, that is clear. Thank you very much. So uh, my poster was on uh, we, on experiments that we did. We set up some seismometers uh, on the surface in and around demolition ranges around the, the country, around South Africa. And we tried to then uh, look at um, predictive equations from, from buried explosions to see if we can use them for the surface explosions as well, because knowing that a lot of the energy from a surface explosion will go into the atmosphere. And we, what we also did is we, because these seismometers were on the surface, uh, a lot of the atmospheric signals were also uh, picked up um, by the seismometers. So we also wanted to see how we can use that information as well for predictive equations. Um, so in, the, in conclusion, what we found is that the we, we found that the uh, United States Bureau of Mines equation uh, that was created for uh, buried explosions, that actually worked quite well for, for what we had for our data set. And we also found uh, something very interesting called the secondary shock wave delay, um, which is also, we used it for our the atmospheric signals that we picked up, um, which also produced very good, very good results. And uh, obviously the usefulness of these prediction equations would depend on, on what you would actually like to, to look at. Um, so obviously your, your USBM or your Bureau of Mines uh, equation would look at more of your ground motion, your, your peak particle velocities. Whereas your secondary shock wave um, delays would be very useful for forensic seismology, for instance, if there's an unexpected explosion, um, then one could certainly look at that. Uh, and what we found that was very useful because some of the seismometers, because the implement, the explosion was on the surface, <clears throat> we got we picked up very small or, very, or didn't pick up any ground motion, whereas they definitely picked up the atmospheric signals, whereas where uh, the secondary shock wave would be very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, we move to the next presenter, is Jessica Pebble. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. I'm sorry, I'm struggling to hear the host. Um, so I should just go. Uh, 
it's coming. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So this project is focused on developing an understanding of how variables such as attenuation mythology and instrument response affect the slope of the body wave magnitude log explosion yield relationship. Um, this relationship is described in equation two. The MBMS screening line setting underground explosions from earthquakes currently used by the International Data Centre is shown in figure one there on the right. And for events which fall close to the screening line, a small change in body wave magnitude could result in a change of source characterization. We've used the Muller-Murphy 1971 model to generate synthetic P waves from underground explosion tests carried out at Nevada National Security Site and Galen Mountain. An overview of the processing steps is shown here in figures three and four, and we perform a linear regression to derive a slope of body wave magnitude log yield relationship, and this can be seen in figure five. Studies have previously considered how attenuation affects the intercept, or C, in that equation two. However, this study shows that attenuation the slope as well. Um, so figures 6a and b show that for all instrument responses we tested, increase in T star results in an increase in A. And these figures also show the variation in A values when considering varying lithology types. Um, we find that for alluvium, um, we're consistently producing the smallest A values, with the tuff and granite producing significantly larger values. For so um, figure 7a and 7b show that for varying um, the instrument response, we're having a seemingly small effect on the body magnitude log yield relationship. However, for certain lithology and star combinations, we show the effect is significant. Um, so that's everything. Currently, the MBMS screening line is applied globally. But this work um, suggests it may be more appropriate to derive a regional relationship. So um, if you have any more questions, feel free to come and have a chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. And we move on with Jairo Villalobos. Jairo? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you well. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, good morning. I want to show in this poster uh, work from my colleagues and um, my person. Uh, it's an infrasound bulletin from local and regional source around the country of Costa Rica. I want to mention uh, we installed in 2018 two uh, infrasound stations in Costa Rica to improve our capa capacity building in the analysis of infrasound source. Um, we use the method of PNCC for analysis of the different source around the country. I want to show you here in the right, uh, one infrasound station detect some one hash explosions in Turialba volcano. Uh, I want to show you here some one events around the country and Caribbean and Costa Rica. Uh, one important event is fireball over Bering Sea, about 14 kilometers of the station in Costa Rica. We can detect, detect and other important events, but it's a little event. Cuba meteorite, other meteorite near to IT, um, other near to Puerto Rico, and other two important events for us is one meteorite falling in the territory of Costa Rica. We can see in three infrastructure stations one infrastructure station in Ecuador from IMS. And other important event is a fiber of the Caribbean south of Puerto Rico. And I want to show you here other source of infrasound is one earthquake near to the border of Costa Rica and Panama. We can see the same acoustic coupling territory, and rival infrasound and seismic. And other important event is a landslide in Irasu volcano. We can see in our local infrasound network. I thank you too much. I want I show you here only how can use the infrasound in Costa Rica to to characterize and identify, identify uh, infrasound source. Thank you too much. Thank you very much, Jairo. And we move to the next presenter is Artemi 
Novo Selov. After me, you have uh, two minutes. Uh, yes, great. Uh, thank you. Please let me know if you don't see or don't hear anything. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me present Can you, you hear our it? work, Thunder Size, Seismic Analysis of Thunder Signals Reported in Austria. Thunder is, on one hand, a nuance for routine seismological analysis, and on the other hand, an interesting subject for basic research. We show that seismological networks provide much information on thunder, allowing systematic investigations of thunder and its relation to lightning. When lightning strikes, the high current return stroke wave rapidly hits the lightning channel to extremely high temperatures, near or above 30,000 Kelvin, and creates a channel pressure of more than one megapascal, resulting in channel extension, intense optical radiation, and an outward propagation shock wave that eventually becomes an acoustic wave. The sender. Sender can be recorded with a seismic station and thus can be analyzed. By analyzing thunder, we're also gaining some knowledge about the properties of the lightning. We analyzed 1,412 lightning events recorded with seismic instrumentation of the OPERA uh, and electrical instrumentation of the Austrian lightning location system. Polarization analysis of three component uh, seismic stations reveals azimuth incidence angle, and rectilinearity of the thunder signal. Using these parameters, we can reconstruct the shape of the lightning. We also measure the peak ground displacement recorded with our seismic sensors. We observe a correlation for positive cloud-to-ground lightning between uh, maximum ground displacement and peak current uh, measured in kiloamperes. Surprisingly, we do not observe this correlation at least as strong for other types of lightning. To conclude, we collected a large collection of thunder signals recorded with seismic sensors. We then analyzed each such signal, measured its maximum displacement and duration, and associated each measurement with lightning peak current as recorded by Aldi. We show that one can use polarization analysis on a single three component seismic station to reconstruct the shape of the lightning. And we also observe that maximum displacement of thunder signals from positive cloud to ground lightning is well correlated with its peak current. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we move on with the next uh, presenter. It's uh, Anthony Tuket. Anthony Tuket, you have... Oh. Yeah, I Thank can you. share my screen. Is it, Is it starting? you see my screen right now? Yes, it's coming. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm from Chavkiv. I'm from Norsai. And uh, this uh, this project is in collaboration with the uh, um, center in, in Norsai. In France, it's a center of commissaria of atomic energy and uh, alternative energy, renewable energy in France. Um, and the Swedish Institute of Space Physics and the University of Oslo. Um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the seismoacoustic analysis of uh, my 4.9 earthquake happened in uh, nearby Kiruna. It's a mining induced earthquake. Uh, it happened last year in 2020, uh, 18th of May. And uh, this, this earthquake was very shallow. It's less than one kilometer in depth. Uh, then it has a good coupling towards the atmosphere. And uh, luckily, we managed to record this earthquake both in near field and far field. Uh, near field is less than 10 kilometers to the epicenter, as you see here, that you can, of course, get the better pictures in, the, uh, in my slides if you want to look at it. Um, here you see the PMCC results having the, that we can have from near field. You see the, the seismic. Uh, in the uh, seismic energy coupled to the atmosphere and recorded as infrasound. And also, there are some uh, interesting recordings in PMCC that can perhaps be the aftershock. We're, we're focusing on that to analyze it better. Also, we did some back projection towards the epicenter to, to have some, uh, some back projection levels, some pressure levels, so that we have the, the comparison between epicenter and largest uplift nearby the nearby the uh, mine. Also in far field we have 
good recordings in uh, 155 kilometer in, uh, in, in a 285 kilometer from the epicenter in, in northern Norway. And then we have the, the waveform uh, simulations using uh, using PE analysis and uh, we with some uh, with some Gardner per uh, perturbations to explain the, uh, the the signals better, like signal the, the arrivals better. Yeah, if you if you if you're interested, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to discuss with me. I'll be available. Thank you so much. We move now to the next presenter. The next presenter is Aldila Damayanti Parnamaratri. You have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? We hear you perfectly. Okay. My name is Aldila Damayanti. I'm going to be here. This group is here on air. Now, it's a little bit online. Aldila? Yes. We cannot hear you well now. Uh, I think it's a pre recorded. Can you hear me? Check. Try it again, please. I can hear you, but you, you pre recorded your, your speech in the presentation, and this, this sounds we don't hear well. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, so, so can try, you try it once again? Try again, please. Okay, okay please. Okay, now this is a little of research. And the title is study of seismic and in On the active level of the earthquake in Indonesia. Okay, uh, yes. Al Aldila, can you try to maybe uh, get much closer to the mic? Oh, it's okay. Yeah, that sounds better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, please. Actually, the other person that was asked to do this research, and the first one is the reaction. The reaction is called Aldila. Yes? Unfortunately, we cannot hear when you start presenting. But when we are in a normal conversation, we can hear you very well. But uh, when you start the presentation of your poster, we cannot hear you well. Oh, it's okay. Uh, Thank I, you. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, no, it was okay. Right now, I mean, when you talk, it's fine. I don't know what changes. Can you try one last time? It's okay. I will try. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can I'm speak talking. slowly, maybe we can hear you. Okay, is it clear? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, honestly, there are two factors that motivate us to do this research. The first one is we can see from the introduction here that Indonesia is from area to earthquakes. Not only earthquakes, but also non tectonic earthquakes. The second factor is tectonic and non tectonic earthquakes have minimum frequency. It is a and infrared of waves. Therefore, in this research, we try to integrate both of them to identify and validate these earthquakes. And in the method, we use two different methods to process the data. The first method is using GPMCC to process the infrared data. And the second one is the coherence method to process the seismic data. Based on the processing data, we can get some results. The first one is more parameters can be like the event with that similar frequency and position. It can be seen from the spectrogram and the map, the solar frequency band less than one hertz, and the earthquake epicenter is close to Anak Krakatau mountain. And the second one is not all seismic sensor can detect the event clearly. It can be seen from the figure that there are some sensors in surrounding areas, but the event well detected by infrasound measurement. Finally, we can conclude that both parameter can detect the same event with similar frequency, less than 1 hertz, and position, which is close to Anak Krakatau Mountain. Therefore, we can classify this event as a non-tectonic earthquake by Anak Krakatau activity. 
And seismic is a powerful parameter in terms of tectonic and non-tectonic earthquakes monitoring. And infrasound in particular is an important complement to identify and validate the non-tectonic earthquake. Last but not least, I highly recommend using infrasound as a parameter to identify the non-tectonic earthquakes. I think this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aldila. We could hear something. I would like to invite all other participants. If you could visit Aldila's poster, it shows some interesting uh, information you may be interested in. So we move on with the next presenter. It's uh, Patrick Hook. Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello, Patrick. So. Uh, we would like to invite you to our e-poster presentation entitled Infrasonic Signatures of 1001 Rocket Launches for Space Missions. The study was carried out at the German National Data Center, and I am presenting this poster on behalf of my colleagues, Peter, Christoph, and Lars. So rocket launches for space missions are one source within the variety of infrasound origins. The propulsion engines of rocket vessels produce thrusts of hundreds to thousands of kilonewton to overcome the gravitational influence of the Earth. Several studies uh, focused on infrasound signals from specific rocket types especially, and it's known that different launch phases or processes can be attributed to the generation of infrasound signals. Our study is rather a global approach. We focused on the period from January 2009 to June 2020 and found exactly 1001 launches for space missions, covering various rocket types uh, in terms of thrust and payload uh, from globally, globally distributed spaceports. We estimate the global detectability at the IMS stations and characterize individual signals detected at infrasound areas for example, from the Falcon 9 rocket. And we propose for the first time a robust amplitude energy relation based on nominal rocket thrusts. The study has already got some attention in the news after it was published in Geophysical Research Letters. If you scan the QR code here, you will be directed to the open access publication. We also provide an open access ground truth data set consisting of more than 7,000 infrasound detections from up to 730 launches to encourage further studies based on rocket infrasound. You will find more details in our e-poster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, we move on. Uh, let's see, uh, we try to on to get in contact with Ivan Kitov. I don't know if Ivan is connected. I don't think so. And the next also we tried contact before is Shahar Shani Kadmiel. Are you connected now? Shahar? No. Okay. Um, we had uh, a last minute uh, uh, request from Pastor Marcel. Pastor, do you want to share your slides or make a quick presentation? Uh, good morning, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We hear you well. Thank you, Pastor. So in this study, we uh, wanted to link infrasound detection to storms and lightnings. According to our hypothesis, storms appear as longer, shorter sections on the time versus azimuth diagram as they move in time. We search for storms between May and September each year um, from 2017 to 2020. For that, uh, DIVA was used. In the time interval, 366 super storms were found. The detections were extracted to bulletin files. The figure on the left shows the PMCC detections on 2019, uh, 27th of June. And the detections in the purple uh, bracket are likely to belong to a thunderstorm. 
lightnings map out the storms at a given place at a given time. So in order to identify storms, we correlated lightning positions from Blitzorting database with infrasound detections. The animation shows lightning flashes. Uh, these are the crosses uh, plotted uh, the location of the storms with infrasound detections represented by lines with the corresponding azimuts. Um, of the 366 super storms, 309 were identified as storms using this uh, correlation method. This means the categorization of about 32,000 PMCC detection. And we also try to identify lightning in uh, closed storms up to 50 kilometers. To associate uh, lightnings with infrasound detections, we uh, use temporal and spatial filtering. And the uh, direct wave propagation was uh, assumed. And we can see here a uh, waveform of a lightning. For further uh, details, please contact me or see, see my slides uploaded. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pastor, for your uh, presentation. Just to let the, the presenters know, we reached 180 people in audience, which gives an indication that uh, your work is being given some kind of attention. And thank you very much for keeping working on these matters that are very important to all of us to keep our world uh, safer. Thank you. We yeah. have some time for some few questions. Uh, I haven't received any questions on through the through the system. Uh, so if you have some questions to the what, what was presented or please go ahead. Maybe, Maybe. I will I will start till you, till you uh, think about, oh, Marcel, Marcel, do you want to say something? Uh, sorry, I just forgot to unmute. So to give you some time to think about the, your, your possible questions, I, I will uh, use the opportunity to uh, Say welcome to Li Peng, my former colleague from OSI division, and uh, he was very productive. He has presented four uh, posters. Hi, Li. <laughs> uh, I I have two questions. Uh, one is related to the VSAT that you presented. Uh, the the VSAT can actually connect to all possible uh, satellites? Is, have, have you tested that? Yes, actually, in principle, that, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that is true. Uh, but we have not have the full test in that regard. But uh, anyway, we will follow your instruction properly later on. We can make an uh, arrangement for that. And also, also the interesting presentation or poster you have on, on uh, RFID seals for chain of custody. Uh, oh, oh, my my colleagues uh, from from equipment section Xavier Blanchard also had some some poster. Have you been in contact with with Xavier and and, and the other guys to to somehow coordinate your efforts with with the RFID text? Uh Yes, not yet, but uh, yes, I, I've seen that. It's, it's very interesting. So probably our work is just uh, probably part of your big ambition. So we, we can provide our contribution and embed it, probably embed it into the, the whole system of the on-site inspection division, especially equipment section, okay. if possible. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. We have any more questions from the other participants? While you're thinking, I have uh, one question, just a quick one. 
maybe to Anthony Turquette, but uh, most of your presentations are also related to seismic acoustic sources. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there any minimal, minimal earthquake or explosion underground that would produce uh, uh, enough uh, uh, ground shaking to be coupled uh, by the infrasound stations? Uh, maybe uh, was not clear because uh, probably in your in your research you 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 have tried several events and uh, what I'm asking if there is a kind of a threshold magnitude of any event that could could be detected as a as a threshold in uh, in in your processing by infrasound detection. All right, we can we can keep this question for our platforms. Maybe we we will come to this later. Uh, do we have any uh, other question? Uh, finally, uh, if I can ask a question, just a quick, uh, which is related to the ground penetrating radar. Uh, normally, uh, ground penetrating radar is some uh, uh, can show some problems depending on the ground conditions and also depth of the target. So, uh, in your experiment, did you find uh, this kind of problem and how efficiently it can be in term in a situation of uh, on site inspection? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, actually, uh, as we put in the title, it's commercially uh, widely used penetrating radar. So our experience is is actually, to be honest, to be based on the everyday uh, work related to the to the to the detection of the possible floors or underground caves or pipelines uh, in towns, in cities, on the highways. But this is quite uh, similar to for the detection of the uh, potential observables of on-site inspection. So probably in the future, we can make some uh, trial uh, test of that equipment. Let's say together what we can find with that equipment. I hope that I answered the question. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you very much. We are, unfortunately, we are running out of the time. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for coming online today. And I hope to see you uh, in the next sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.